Bob Block, and I'm the director of uh, BYO Biz, Build Your Own Business. Uh, I know some of you, I've worked with some of you uh, uh, entrepreneurs, and I hope any more entrepreneurs that are out here in the audience will come find me and uh, talk uh, about your business. Uh, tonight we have a great uh, speaker, uh, but before we begin, I just want to give you a few announcements about upcoming events. Um, okay, so Cyrus is in the ski business. On September 28th, we have another ski industry pioneer in a slightly different role. We have Jason Leventhal, who some of you may have heard speaking here in the last year or so. He's the founder of Line Skis, a very successful uh, ski company, now on a new venture called J Skis. He's going to be doing a workshop on bootstrap finance um, for your business. So bootstrap, bootstrapping is a buzzword uh, in the entrepreneurship business that means basically uh, uh, getting there without too many in the, too much money in the way of resources. And so if you don't have a lot of money to start your business, you go and scramble wherever you can. It's, it's sort of an art to it, it's sort of a science to it. And Jason is one of the masters of it. He's built two businesses sort of starting off that way. Well, the second one, not so much. Um, but he's going to do a little workshop at 3.30 on Monday on the 28th. Uh, very interesting. If you want to go, there's an Eventbrite. You can sign up. Space is limited. And I hope to see you there. The next speaker on October 6th, we're going to leave the ski industry and we're going to go into high-tech uh, medicine. And we have a fellow, uh, Dr. Barry Finette, who is a, pe well, a noted pediatrician, but in, uh, in the course of going and around the world and helping uh, and seeing uh, thousands of uh, children in poor countries who basically are going to die because they don't, the health care system there, they don't have enough trained doctors. And he's going to use a smartphone and he's building an app, his company is, to enable the most lowest level health care worker in any country um, diagnose and treat the major causes of childhood mortality. Uh, it's a fascinating story, and I think you'll be very inspired, and you'll learn a lot by that. That's October 6th, and I won't go into the other ones. We have some other speakers later on in the term, and some more workshops. But tonight, oh, I want to announce one more thing. Um, we haven't announced it yet, but I'll preview it for you. There's a a great event in this town, Burlington, called Launch VT. And it's a chance for entrepreneurs of all ages to pitch their business to a group of, of judges uh, with the winner getting a top prize of $25,000 cash, uh, dollars in cash to invest in their business, as well as other services, legal services, accounting services, to help their business grow. And a bunch of us in Vermont at uh, colleges and universities have gotten together and we're going to have a, a, a event called Launch VT Collegiate. And it's for all college uh, entrepreneurs to compete. The finals will be held in February of this year. Actually, the first ones are going to be held at Champlain College. And we're working on getting a $10,000 first prize for that. Every college, including Champlain, will pick one representative to represent the college in this uh, Launch VT Collegiate event. And uh, I'm pretty close to having uh, some prize money for that, too. So if you're an entrepreneur, which doesn't mean you have to have an operating business, if you have an idea that you've been working on, and you think you just need a little bit of, a little bit of something to get it going, uh, this might be a great opportunity for you uh, not only to sharpen up your pitch, but also to maybe uh, to earn some money to invest in your business. So you'll be hearing more about that as the semester goes on. Um, now, tonight, we are very fortunate to have Cyrus Schenk with us. Cyrus, are, are you still 24? All right. So this guy's not too far down the road from where most of you are, right? So this guy's 24. Um, I have to say, I'm not, I'm not supposed to sh say that because we like to encourage uh, you to stick around, but, but, um, but Cyrus uh, had a very good reason 
uh, to leave college because he left. He learned something in college that inspired him to go start this business, Renowned Skis. And he uh, has taken it a long way. And uh, it's interesting to note that last March, in fact, where I met Cyrus, is Cyrus competed in last March's Launch VT uh, competition. And his uh, company and his pitch, uh, and you'll see why in a minute, uh, won that. So he won $25,000 and a bunch of other stuff, right? And uh, so now he's here tonight to tell you what he's been working on and share his ideas and maybe get some ideas from you. So let's have a warm welcome. Awesome. Yeah, so as you said, uh, I won the launch VT, and I was just talking to a few, few of you before it was got going, and that is one of the reasons why I'm still here, is Vermont and Burlington has such an amazing community of people. Um, there's about, I think I've drawn on, I think there's about six or seven, eight or eight different companies that had pitched in the in-kind services on top of the cash that I have learned so much from those people um, in the past couple months. So those, that's the kind of reason why I'm still in Vermont, because people here are just incredible. But so I just want to talk about Renown and what it's, what it's all about. This ski here, it won the ISPO Gold Award, which is the world's probably the most premier award in the ski industry to date. We beat the world's largest ski companies, the biggest R&D departments, multi-million dollar endeavors with nothing more than 12 by 20 foot square foot room, some hand tools, and a pretty crazy idea. It wasn't rocket science. I've since gone to be published in USA Today. We have a distribution model that is going to rock this industry. It has been an absolute roller coaster. This company has it all. We've done everything from battle our internal partners to have negotiations with multi-million dollar companies. I've slept in the back of my car at negative 13, and I've been on the stage at ISPO in Munich, Germany. I've seen a lot. And I wanna, I'm here to tell you my experience the past three years, what I have learned. And I'm not a professor. I don't have 20 years of experience in this business. I, I'm not a tried and true entrepreneur, so to speak. But what I do have is something that is extremely relevant to what you are all going through right now. As he said, I'm 24. I'm not much older than any of you. I'm no smarter than any of you. And I'm going to tell you how I took what I had and created something that won the top prize. Well, first I'm going to tell you about myself so you understand where I came from. Um, and then I'll talk about Renown. And then from there, I'll go into 10 points that I've kind of put together over the past 10 years. So I was born in Illinois. I moved here when I was eight years old, and I was that kid that was just running around outside. Like my mom, I'm pretty sure, was chasing me with a spatula, spanking me the whole way. And I was always playing with Legos. I remember taking mod airplanes and just racing them through like the trees or branches and stuff, you know, pretending like it was some kind of like some kind of dog fight. And uh, I went to a high school at CVU, and which is a call or a high school just down the road. And while I was there, I started a window washing business. It was kind of like how I made money. And while I was at CVU. I learned pretty quickly I like working with my hands. I had taken a couple classes and I realized that the classes that I liked the most or the ones I disliked the least were the ones where I could pick something up and touch it and manipulate it. It was like Lego classes or, or CAD building classes. And so between running around outside, building catapults in my backyard, playing with Legos and learning that I like to work with my hands, it made sense that I would be an engineer. All my friends told me that, all my parents told me that, my parents' friends said, you're gonna be an engineer. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna be an engineer, awesome. Except my high school guidance counselor, um, she told me after I got my SAT scores and my GPA was kind of finalized that I was, quote, the most average white male in America. <laughs> so, put a little damper on things and I applied to UVM, I applied to Clarkson, and about a slew of other schools in the, the East Coast. And I actually got rejected from UVM, and I somehow got into Clarkson. I have no idea why. I'm pretty sure they made a mistake. But here I am like, at Clarkson, right? I'm going to be an aeronautical engineer. This is going to be awesome, right? But I freaked out. 
you know, when you go to school and you're labeled the most average guy and you go to a school that's and one of the toughest uh, engineering programs in a school that you think is like an echelon above what you're supposed to be, um, I wasn't sure what I was gonna do. And I worked that first semester, I got there and I worked my butt off. There was no way I was gonna go home and I thought I was gonna like drop out of school, I thought I was gonna flunk out and I was, there was no way I was gonna come home because of that. So I worked my butt off and at the end of the semester, I got my GPA in and with it I got a, lot, a letter being accepted to the honors program. I had almost a 4.0, somehow I had figured out the system of, of college. I threw the letter away until I realized that it was worth $2,000, so I went back to the trash and pulled it back out, and suddenly I'm in honors, right? But I kept going through school, and I, but something was missing. Uh, I, was, I knew I was there for engineering, I knew I was there to get my degree, I was gonna make you know, 50, 60, $70,000 plus when I got out of school, and it was gonna be great. But I understand why. Like, I knew what I was gonna have, I didn't understand why I was doing it. So I actually almost left school. And uh, it was because my friends said, pulled me aside and said, hold on, man. Like, what are you doing? Like, don't just leave school. Like, you haven't, you've only done two years at, you know, at Clarkson. There's so much more out there. Try something else. I was like, all right, fine. I'll get a job. So I went out and I worked for GE, the world, one of the world's largest companies. And I worked at General Electric. I live in Lake Tahoe. I had a pass to five different ski resorts. I had a big salary. I had a G credit card where I could fly around the country and rent cars and buy food in my hotel rooms on their bill. And it was awesome. It was not much more a 20 year old kid could, uh, could ask for. But again, there was something that was missing. There was some aspect of that job that I knew just wasn't sustainable. What happens if I had a family? What happens if I wanted to do something else? I was stuck in this system that I knew I didn't want to be in. So I'm back to school. I'm back to Clarkson. Semester, there's this fall semester my junior year, and I'm working away, and it was so incredibly stressful. The classes started getting really hard. I was working on the side, and I remember I came home for Christmas, and I thought, I thought hard about what I was doing there, what I wanted to get out of school, what I was putting into school, and I remember I was hiking up Camel's Hump, which is a mountain not too far from here with my little sister. And we're hiking up there and it was freezing cold and the snow had just fallen. We're hiking up and one of us had mentioned the idea of, again, leaving school. And this feeling of just like weightlessness or just this stress just totally was like lifted off my shoulders. And right then and there I, had, I knew that I had to leave school. I wasn't, was not in my, my path to do it. And so I went back home, and I thought about it just to make sure I wasn't making the wrong decision. And right before I went to Clarkson, called them up. Said, yep, not coming back. And they kind of freaked out. They were like, why are you not coming back, man? You're doing, you're doing great. And I was like, yeah, this is not what I want to do. I'm not sure what I want to do, but I'm going to figure it out. And if, if it is school, I'll come back. And they're like, all right, sounds good. Well, the door is always open. They left the door open. And so, you know, here I am. My parents are at work. I'm supposed to go back to Clarkson to pick up my stuff. And so I wrote my parents a little note. Dear mom and dad, um, thank you so much for Christmas. Uh, it was awesome. The food was great. Um, love Cyrus. P.S. I dropped out and just put on the counter. And I went and picked up my stuff. And I get this phone call, like, home's calling. So I, you know, pick it up, put it on speakerphone, kind of back away, and I kind of expected it to blow up. So my parents. And they actually understood. My dad, it turned out, had dropped out when he was my age, and he's now a doctor. My mom, though she didn't understand, she said she was gonna support me, whatever I wanted to do. That was two and a half years ago. And the story of renown started long before that. It started before I left school. It started before I dropped out. And it, it honestly didn't start much different than where you guys are right now. In fact, I found this picture. I literally just downloaded this from a, a Facebook um, file that I had. There we go. And this is what we were doing, right? And this is fall. We were breaking up leaves and just riding our bikes in. The dorm room right behind there is that's where we were all living at the time. This is the kind of stuff we were doing. We literally started in the dorm rooms. 
it was, it, was a bunch, it was a group of six of us total, five other guys, Cameron Jones, Gregory Bright, Donnie Leonow, Bob Pelletier, and Ryan Erickson and myself. And we were always driving between Clarkson and Jay Peak. And Clarkson and Jay Peak's three hours, one way. So we had a lot of time between the two to talk about what we're learning in school and classes and how we wanted to apply that to some of our crazy ideas and skis and why the big companies aren't putting these things in and what other things we want to try that they weren't trying. And so we wrote up this business plan and uh, kind of like a competition that you guys will be seeing pretty soon. And we wrote this thing up and we were like, okay, we're gonna build an awesome ski. And we're gonna use engineering. And we're writing this stuff down. We put this business plan together, which was maybe three pages long and send it out to uh, Syracuse University. They had a business plan competition and the cash prize was five grand, right? We're psyched. We sent it off and we had a call. We had a call from my, uh, our advisor at the time and he calls us up and he's like, hey guys, uh, you, should, you should go down to that Syracuse thing. We're like, yeah, man, well, why? He's like, well, I mean, it'd just be kind of cool. It's like, I think you guys are in the top 10. We're like, okay, top 10 of what, like 11 entries or something? Like, I don't think it's gonna be that hard. He said, no, you should really go down. So, all right, fine, we'll go down. We went down to Syracuse University. Turns out we won. We won the $5,000 and we were psyched. Here's a photo of us, all six of us, holding up, it was a cheesy, you know, those cheesy cardboard checks, right? We're holding it up and we were like over the moon, right? And so we're thinking like, okay, do we actually split it up? Should we just go on a road trip? Should we go out west and just go skiing for a little bit? Or should we actually build a ski? Because it was our money. We could do whatever we wanted with it. We decided, no, we're gonna build some skis. We're gonna, we're gonna do what we said. How we known what we were getting ourselves into, we never, we never would have started. And that money, we put in a bank account and it sat for 12 months. Until, when I was working at GE, I picked up my computer, and in some of my free time, I started designing the first ski press. And that's it right there. It is probably one of the most janky things you'll ever see. I have no idea how we actually made skis with that thing. It, um, it was about $1,000 worth of steel. It weighed about 800 pounds, and when it wasn't in compression, the whole top section would actually rock back and forth. And uh, it was kind of a miracle that it never toppled over on any of us. Um, and the hose in there, that orange stuff, or the, um, the orange, yellow stuff, is actually a fire hose that one of my friends from Heavenly, who was working there at the time back in Tahoe, had shipped us so we can make our, our bladder system. So we designed the ski press, and we built that thing in the summer after I left GE, right? So I'm not left to school yet. I just left GE, in the summer we built that thing. That fall, the fall before I left school, we, built, we had that press and we built one ski. And I really wish I had it here today because it was totally terrible. It, the sidewalls were wood, they were cr crooked. Uh, we never even mounted it. We, we pressed the thing, cut it out, and laughed. We call it the brick because it's so stiff. And we just put it on the wall, kind of as a memento to, for ourselves for, to see where we came from. And then <laughs> I left school. That's when I left school. Renown was not this crazy concept. It was not this award-winning company. It was a janky press and a terrible ski. That's when I left school. Because I knew I had to do something different. I had to do something that was outside the norm, outside what I was being taught to do as an engineer. It just wasn't what I wanted to do. And again, I went back home with that ski and that press in the shop, and I knew there was no way I was gonna come home and just sit on my parents' couch. And so, Myself and the other guys, we set a goal for ourselves. We were gonna make six professional looking pairs of skis by our, by our spring break, right? It's a lot to go from the, the worst ski you've ever seen to six professional looking pairs, right? But that was our goal, that's what we're gonna set. I was kind of on permanent vacation since I had just left school, my friends, we had spring break coming up, so that's where our goal was for. And we almost made it. In fact, we had about five skis, and I say about because one of them was, uh, the edges were falling off, so we really didn't ski it, but Four, the other four skiers were amazing. In fact, we got the US ski team, uh, I think we tricked them or something, but we got them to hold up our ski. And I'm really looking forward to the day when one of these girls, I'm pretty sure they're Olympians now, um, can look back and see this photo, because this uh, definitely, this sent us over the top. We couldn't believe that we had got one of these people, one of these, these, these girls to hold up, hold up this ski. And one of those skis we took up to Squaw, two and a half years later, was the basis of how we won the ISPO award, which we had no idea at the time. 
again, oh, again came home. And again, this is right after leaving school, about six months, like four months after leaving school. And again, we're out of money. Uh, the, six, the five grand was gone. We had spent it between the, the first ski, the first press, and the, first, you know, the next six pairs of skis. And it was springtime. But I had this window washing business that I had started back in high school that I knew I could possibly rebuild that bank account. So I went back to work washing windows. Now this time I had about 50 clients I was washing in Shelburne, Charlotte, um, and Burlington area, right? And I was gonna rebuild the bank account. I was gonna use window washing to fund what we were gonna do in the ski world. And that spring, when we started washing, when I started washing windows again, we sent out some test samples that we had just kind of whipped together with some skis with a non-Newtonian polymer. Something we had heard about in school and thought was kind of cool. And we made these up and we sent them to the lab. And they were just out in the lab. We didn't think much of it. And so they're out there. And I'm washing windows all summer long. In the fall, we got ourselves a new goal. We're gonna make 20 pairs of skis. And we're gonna do it for our friends and family. We're gonna sell them for 575 bucks. And they're gonna be fully custom. So we're gonna sit down with our friends. And we're talk to them. And we're gonna build the perfect ski for them to do a full custom build. And so we start that process. We start interviewing people. We start the design process. And I get this call from Cameron, and he says, hey man, we got the test data in. I was like, oh, shoot. what does it say, man? And it turns out, he said, it was absolutely insane. And so it's a little hard to describe on a graph here, but I'll try, I'll try to do it this way. Essentially, the, the red line is any ski in the world. Uh, the steepness of that line will be depending on the stiffness of a ski. And that is just saying that as you shake it harder, so from right this is, excuse me, from left to right, as you shake the ski harder, it stays about the same dampness, which is a factor of stability, which is what you have in a stability stiff ski, so a race ski, right? The green line is a ski with a non-Newtonian polymer, something that as you shake it harder, it becomes resistive to that force, so it becomes an ax like it's so much stiffer. So with this data, we knew we could change a ski's performance characteristics by at least 200%, if not higher. Which meant that we could go from something that acted much more like a, like a park ski, a softer noodle ski, and as you skied faster and harder, that it could suddenly poof, have the tendencies and characteristics of a race ski. And we could do that all in the exact, the exact same instant of time in the exact same ski. You didn't have to go out and buy a bunch of skis, right? And it was at this moment that we had finally found something that made us totally different. This was something, this data told us that there was no company in the world that was creating a ski that could do this. And so we latched on to this. This was gonna be our secret sauce. But we're still building these skis, right? 20 pairs left to go. And at this point, mind you, I was working at Arts Riot, which is a bar right down the road. They had just opened up. I was still washing windows, and I was driving between Burlington and Potsdam, a three-hour drive each way, and where the shop is, building these skis. And I would get to the shop at six, six or seven in the morning. I would work until midnight or 1 a.m. if I was lucky, and get back out and just do it again, and do it again, and do it again. And that just after Christmas, actually on Christmas Eve, <laughs> I just remembered this, um, this, uh, exactly a year after I decided to leave school, I was sleeping on the shop floor with nothing more than a towel and a Carhartt jacket for a blanket. So I wasn't thinking that I was the smartest guy in the world at that point, right? But we got our goal. We built the 20 skis, but they weren't good enough to sell, so we ended up just giving to our friends. And the last couple pairs, we built for ourselves. And we did what any good ski company does. And we took those pairs and we went out west to test them. And this is a van we bought here in Burlington for like 1,500 bucks. My friend Jack Jessup, the guy on the left there, he got the whole inside out and put bunk beds and like we had things folded down from the ceiling. We had compartments for skis. We had boot heaters in there. We had, we had seat belts for five people and we could sleep eight. Other way around. We could, sleep, we could sit, seat eight people and have seat belts or, and sleep. We could fit a lot of people, we'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> the thing was huge. <laughs> And uh, so we went out west. And what we were asking ourselves was, do, like, we have this data, like, how does it work in an actual ski? We're doing some data points. We're testing. Not a bad thing to do to test, right? And we love them. Came back home in the spring, and again, no money. Pick up the squeegee again. But this time, I've got 100 customers. Back at it. 
And at this point, I started to see a pattern, right? Like every winter was awesome, every fall was like busy, but in the spring, you're always out of money, right? And so I remember talking to my parents about giving up, like what was I doing? Like the ski industry is not lucrative. <laughs> you know, if you make it good, if you make it big, you kind of break even. It's not, it's not this crazy endeavor that it's not gonna be a Facebook, it's not gonna be a Twitter kind of thing. You're not gonna see like a billion dollar return on investment, no. It's a pursuit of passion. And I remember talking to my parents about this and just asking like, was I crazy? Like I left school to start something that was at this point turning into a pretty cyclic uh, endeavor. I was really questioning what I was doing. But, we also, but I also knew I could mash windows and we had an idea that I knew no one else had. And our next step was to decide whether to keep making skis myself or if I was gonna get a manufacturer to increase our quality and increase our consistency. And I remember I was sitting the steps of a, a guy named Paul Budnitz, and um, he's a pretty smart guy. And I was sitting in the front steps, and I was eating a bowl of vanilla ice cream. I was talking to him, and I was like, hey, Paul, like, I have this really cool idea. I know it's awesome, but like, I've got this manufacturing thing, but I've got no idea how I'm supposed to pay for this. Like, like what happens if I pull the trigger? If I, if I go for this, like, what happens if it works? Like, who am I to bring a new invention to the world? I don't have a degree. I don't know anything, especially with the ski industry, and hardly about myself. And he said this. He said, Cyrus, if you're 80 years old, and you're looking back on your life, and you're looking at this decision, what would you do then? So it was a pretty easy decision after that. I went home, called a manufacturer, and said, I want 50 skis. Boom, locked it in. What I didn't tell him was I had no money, right? So I just washed a ton of windows. And when the last bill for manufacturing came in, I had just cashed my final window washing check, and phoom, ooh, sorry. And uh, phoom, those, those uh, the bank accounts basically swapped places, and I paid for the first manufacturing run. Then we threw a big party. That's our, our rep, Roy, one of the coolest guys in know. And this is that over at Arts Riot. We had a total blast, right? Packed my, this is November, packed my bags up in December, went on to Tokyo. Why Tokyo? Because they sell more skis in one block than all of North America combined. And what I learned out in Tokyo was that our idea, our concept, it literally bridged language barriers. I could go talk to somebody in a shop that doesn't even speak English, and they got it. Right? I knew not only was this a good idea, I wanted to work, but now it was extremely marketable. After Tokyo, I flew back to Seattle and uh, I, bought a, I bought a truck out there. And I started talking to one shop at a time. One shop at a time. I thought I had the world's coolest idea, and here I was driving my truck around, putting food in my mouth and gas in my gas tank to try to tote my idea to one shop at a time out of the thousands out there. I thought, again, that I was an idiot. I was doing something totally weird and totally dumb. And I remember getting on the phone with my parents and just basically crying to them and just telling them, like, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Again, I'm spending all this money on an idea that I think is awesome, but no one's buying it. No one's lining up to pur you know, purchase the orders. They, they weren't flying in the door. They all wanted to see what were gonna happen to me. They're all waiting to see what was gonna happen. And I was struggling with you know, thoughts like, it wasn't a real company, it's just an idea. I'm spending this money for what? And I looked at my bank account, and I had about $250, $300 left. And I was in Tahoe at the time, and I knew that with the $300, I could get myself from Tahoe to Denver, where the trade show was, the, like the biggest trade show in the US. And I decided, I had a mind shift. I decided that I was not going to fizzle out and pop. Just like I wasn't gonna sit on the couch in my parents' house, I was, there's no way I was gonna work all this, all, work so hard to get here to just run out of money and have to like borrow some money to come home or something. So I decided if I was gonna go, I was gonna go out hard. I was gonna go with a bang and I was, that was gonna be it. And right now it was gonna be a cool thing, but I learned a lot and that was it. As soon as I had that mindset set shift, three things happened. Got three emails. The first one was saying some new test data came in. 
And this new test data said that our skis weren't going to only be 200% better, but over 300% better. And these were two skis compared side by side, one with a non-Newtonian polymer and one without it. The second one was that we just won this thing called ISPO Gold, which I had no idea what it was at the time. I found out later. And the third was from my first investor, who had just wired over the cash necessary to finish out my winter. So I'm totally psyched again. I drive to Denver, and we put this sign, psh, ISPO Gold, above our, we had about five feet of space on the wall at our trade show in, in, at SIA in Denver. About five feet of space, put this sign up there that said ISPO Gold Winter Award. We had the CEO's K2, a lot, no, sorry, K2, Fisher came by, Atomic, G3, Black Diamond, Moment. These guys are all wondering how a company with no more than five feet of wall space just beat them at their own game. So I flew to Tokyo, picked up, a, geez, picked up the award. And uh, so those are our skis right there on the carpet. And the ones next to them is none other than the world's largest manufacturer of skis, Alon. And to have your skis, it didn't really sink in. I don't really get what it was about until we saw that. And uh, to have your skis next to a company that won in a, in a different category, um, that's also one of the world's leading companies, uh, that was when I understood what we had just done. It's pretty cool. So I came home yet again, picked up the window, picked up the squeegee, and this, and I was this spring, and I had 183 clients, right? So I'm, I'm rolling now. I got 183 clients, gonna wash a ton of windows. Got back home, one launch VT. With that, got published in USA Today. Then we went to Mount Hood, met this guy named Mike Nick, who is the branding brains behind the company Orage, which is out of Montreal. Got his help on, we went to Mount Hood, did some photo shoots, put together a whole brand package, read the website, got the videos rolling, and boom, we just launched our website three days ago. That's the story of now. It is crazy, it is hectic. Like I said, we've been on the stage at ISPO. I've slept in the back of my car when it's freezing cold out. This has not been an easy ride by any means. And today we announced that we're selling our skis online and our goal, yet again, Set ourselves a goal, so we're going to sell out. So through all this, through the, through the three and a half years of renown, through the two and a half years of me being out of school, I've put together 10 items that I have found have been extremely useful for myself in this business, like 10 things that I've learned along the way. This is the first one. Every text matters. Let me tell you a story. When we were out at doing our testing and that, that submarine, that big, that big van, right? We're out in Mount Baker and we're sh sh pulling off our boots, putting them in the, the van. And this guy pulls up and he's like, yo, you guys from Vermont? I'm like, dude, license plate says Vermont. I'm like, yeah. Um, and he's like, oh man, you guys have Hattie Topper? We're like, yeah, dude. <laughs> like, we're not stupid. <laughs> we're gonna get Hattie Topper. And like, he didn't want to say anything, right? So <laughs> we chatted for about half an hour. And then he's like, all right, man, I got to go. Peace out. I'm going get to my, get my friends. So he zoomed around the parking lot, picked up his friends, and he came back around. And when he came back around, I flagged him down. My friend opened up the back door, threw it a hay topper, caught it, threw it in his front seat, right? See you later, man. And he zoomed off. And he was psyched. He couldn't believe what just happened, right? Fast forward two years. I just flew in from Tokyo. I'm buying this truck from this girl named Jamie. We, uh, I gave her the cash. She gives me you know, the, the, the title. And she's like, well, Lee, like, what do you do? Like, you, you flew in yesterday. You're buying a truck. Like, what are you crazy? I was like, oh, well, I sell skis. I'm on this mission to do whatever. And she's like, oh, it's really cool, man. Like, my boyfriend writes for a ski journal. I was like, that's pretty cool. She's like, you should totally talk to him. So through her, I got hooked up with her boyfriend. Her boyfriend hooks me up with this freelance writer. I'm on the phone with the freelance writer this past summer. We're chatting for like two hours. At the end of it, he's like, yo, I also noticed that you have some pictures of Mount Baker on your website. And I was like, yeah, we were out there doing some testing like two years ago. And he's like, were you guys driving a gray van? It's like, yeah. It's like, dude, you guys gave me a heady topper. <laughs> so if something as crazy as that can come back around full circle, think about everything that you're doing. Every time you pull up that phone, Every time you talk to somebody, it is saying something about you. 
And it's either something for you or it's something against you. Know that. Everything you do counts. Not tomorrow, not next week or whatever, now. Not when you graduate, now. Number two, be a lifelong student. Ask questions. You gotta go out and talk to people, right? When I was pitching my ski, I was also pitching this idea of drop shipment, which was just a crazy idea I cooked up to get around the typical distribution model that was set up in the 70s before computers existed. And I had this crazy idea that we were gonna change not only how we build skis and design them, but also how we deliver them. And so while I was pitching my skis, I would also slide on the side, like, hey, what do you think about this idea? And based off of those questions that I asked, I now know that this year, our drop shipping method is gonna work really well. Paul Bunnitz, one of the smartest guys I know, when he started his bike company, guess what he did? He walked around to all the companies he could find, all the, all the manufacturers, all the bike shops, and went in and just asked a ton of questions. This guy knew, knows what a crank looks like. He knows what a bike seat is. He'd go around and ask people what the most popular bike seats were, the most, color, most popular colors, the most popular designs, what items people were looking for. It's okay to just act a little bit. You don't have to be, to be dumb. Just, you can just act a little inquisitive sometime. It is totally okay. Think of Google, right? They don't answer your questions for you. You still have to type it in. Ask questions. The person that asks the questions is the one that gets ahead. Number three, find your HDT. HDT is what we call that non-Newtonian polymer that we discovered. Putting that into a ski, that's what we dubbed HDT. That is the single thing that differentiates us from every other ski company in the world. There's something like 1,600 mountain skis on the market today. That is the one thing that we latched onto. We didn't have a 10. We didn't have 20, we had one. That's all you guys need. You can do a couple things. You can do something different, you can do something better, or you can do both. That's what we're doing. HGT, it's, just a little, it's different, it's certainly better, and we're gonna do them both at the same time. As you guys move forward in your college career, that's all you're doing. You're being a little bit different than somebody else, you're doing that little thing a little bit better than somebody else, and that is what sets you apart. Number four, this is one of my favorite sayings, get creative. If, you, if there's a problem, go out and solve it. Get, when we did this, this drop shipping method, we didn't apply the same rules that everybody else did. We didn't go out and create this awesome ski and then sell it like everybody else. No, we got creative. We just we thought up some we got, we thought up something totally different. When we put this non-Newtonian material in a polymer, we were just thinking outside the box. We were getting creative. That's all it was. Nothing crazy. Number five. Um, who just played the game Battleship? Anybody play that game when they're a kid? Right? Yeah. It's just like this is all it is, right? You're sitting there, and you have no idea what your objectives are. You have no idea what's on the other side of this board. In life, it's the skill sets you have. It's the, the, the issues that you, the things you aren't good at. It's the things you are good at, right? So you're sitting there, you're guessing and checking, you're firing things off, and once in a while, poof, something hits. Same thing as you go forward in your business, in your career, if you're in college, go out and find those things and discover those things that you're good at and that you're bad at. Try a new class. Try something that you, like, you think you might be interested in, but maybe not, because then you'll know. We wouldn't know if this stuff would work unless you tried it, so we did. Well, I worked for GE. I decided, decided that was a miss. I didn't like that. Aeronautical engineering, that was kind of probably a miss. I didn't like that. Building my own skis. I decided that I was not going to spend my own time building my own skis, so I found one of the best guys in North America to do it for me. It's just a bunch of misses, right? But from that, I learned how to make the best ski. I learned how to bridge those gaps. Number six, ask yourself the hard question. This is super straightforward. Ask yourself those hard questions. If you don't, who will? 
Number seven, this is a pretty personal one, it's travel. Vermont is a bubble. Verm Burlington is a bubble. Put a backpack on. I don't care if you hitchhike down to Mont Montpelier or down to Massachusetts or down to Florida or to California or fly across the world, but get out and travel. It gives you some perspective on life. It makes you realize that maybe the homework that you're stressing about or that, that thing that's really bugging you, in the grand scheme of things, not that big a deal. It gives you perspective, it gives you, um, it gives you a scale on your life. So you, going forward, you know what bad is and you know what good is. And you can judge it accordingly. Eight, this one's super simple. Say thank you. It still will pull at the heartstrings of everybody I know, including myself. You get a good thank you, whether it's a text, whether it's a phone call, whether it's a letter, something that just says, thank you for your time, your mind, appreciate it. That's all it needs to be. Number nine, set goals and read them. My sister would like, hammer me on this point, and I never set them until one day, I was like, fine, I'll set a goal. You think winning, like being on the front page of Burlington Free Press was a goal? Yeah, it was. Do you think winning an award was? Yeah, it was. I started setting these little goals for myself that I wanted to accomplish. But first, I set this vision. I set out and said, what do I want to do? Like, when, you know, when you start a business, right? People ask you, what, like, what's, the, oh, what's the point of the business? What, like, what's, your, what's your mission statement? And you're like, I'm going to make skis. <laughs> right, yeah, the best skis in the world. Right? It's, it's hard to do, but set yourself a crazy goal, something that someone can look at and be like, oh my gosh. Like, who, who does this guy think he is? Right? But I want to read more. And keep reading. Right? So set yourself a crazy vision and then just take one dang step in that direction. If you guys want to graduate, right? what do you do? Do you walk up with a black gown on and be like, yo, I'm going to graduate? No, you go to class. You go to one class at a time. You do one homework at a si assignment at a time. You do one problem at a time. Set yourself a crazy, audacious vision and just do one little thing in that direction. Super simple. Number 10, and this is one that I personally still struggle with, is celebrate your victories. Relax. This is just your life. The times when things get craziest, the most busy, are the times you want to sit back and you should be soaking that in. What you guys are going through right now, it's an awesome experience. What you're going through in, in five years, that's going to be an awesome experience. Sit down and soak it in. You got one shot at this. So here we are. We're at Champlain. I'm just talking to you guys about a ski company I started, right? What are you going to do differently? What is your HDT? There's so much that I know I'm not good at, and I'm slowly figuring that aspect of it out with Renown. But just do this one thing. Whether it's graduate school, whether it's start a business, whether it's just completing the homework assignment, just do one thing. Set something huge, and then the one step to get in that direction. That's all Renown is. We just started with a simple idea to just make a ski. And from that, we backed out what we need to make that ski. And doing that enough times, over and over again, enough prototypes, enough windows, we got ourselves to a goal. And we are on a track to sell every pair of skis that we've made this year. It's pretty cool. So I challenge you, go out and find your one thing. Thanks, guys. How does it, are you saying like that how does it so physically? Like, not like physical, like, I don't know, it, um, it just seems weird to, uh, weird to me almost, because I'm used to like very hard skis for mm -hmm. racing, and I have very yeah. that are just there for fun. Yeah, yeah, so a race ski is super stiff, right? That's kind of the point of a race ski. A stiff ski is also super damp, right? Like you just throw it down, it's like, it's as solid as a rock, right? 
a polymer, a non-Newtonian polymer, can have those rock solid characteristics, like that, that solid feeling, without actually being rock, like a rock. So you can have a ski that's lighter and just as damp as a race ski, or you can have a race ski that weighs like a race ski, but acts like it's someone just put a sh another sheet of metal in it. So this stuff is actually the most applicable in a race ski. This is where the most exciting part of it becomes, is we're, we're going to the consumer market, we're going after the people that ski every day kind of thing. Where this is gonna make the biggest difference is when we get on the feet of like Lindsey Vaughn. That's when we start shaving off, not like milliseconds, but seconds. That's what we're most excited about, is we're, we're doing our trajectory, and that's what our ultimate vision is to do, is, is to get this stuff into some people that are just cruising. And ideally some Americans, so, yeah. Where on the ski is the HDT? Is it like a full layer, and there are just little pockets of it? Sure, yeah, so actually, so this ski is, um, is I have two, well, the other set of, the other pair of this has a window, and you can see into it. And it's actually, this ski actually only has eight, eight channels total. There's three at the tip, there's two underfoot that, are, that run on either side of your binding, and three at the tail. And so it's actually like 15%. So we take the wood core and basically shave out about 15% of that wood and re inlay that HTT. And that 15%, we thought, like, okay, we're gonna have like 20% better, right? No, when we saw that it was like 300%, that's why we freaked out, is because we put 15%, and made a lighter ski that acts like a heavier ski, what happens if you put like 45% in? Like think of where we can go with backcountry. Like we've just scratched the surface, just barely. Yeah. How fastenable is the HDT? Um, we are in the process of that. That's one of the first things I did before I left school is profile for uh, a patent. So we're 36 months in the process right now. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Correct, yeah. Nope, so uh, there's actually a lot of people in the world that make a non-Newtonian material. It's not like ketchup, non-Newtonian, right? Crazy stuff. It's, um, so we put a sheer thickening, and that's a sheer thinning, so it's kind of the opposite side of the spectrum. But, so we don't have, we, so we don't have patents on the actual stuff, which is totally fine, because we have people we can buy it from. But we have a pat utility patent, exactly, to basically put a non-Newtonian material inside of a ski, or snowboard. Yeah, so I know some companies are already testing with it. Yeah. Have you done with snowboard yet? Uh, no, but a snowboard is just a wide ski. So, I mean, what I'm just saying, what I'm saying is you can totally do it. Yeah. Yeah. So are you going to focus more on the technology and like marking the technology of it, or are you just like trying to, are you trying to focus on the design and just trying to get that with people? I don't know. How's your marketing? Yeah. Absolutely. So this, uh, this ski is actually last year's model. Um, you, I mean, check our website, our new graphics are up there. But we're actually focusing on the technology. I mean, design's a design. Anybody can hire a graphic designer to get a cool top sheet, right? So we, I mean, I think our top sheet's awesome, of course. But what we don't have, or what no one else can do, what we can do is the HGT. So yeah, we're totally in this technology. In fact, um, the guy that's presenting next, Jason Leventhal, he just introduced me to some of the um, top editors at Free Skiing Mag, Powder Mag, all those guys. And just saying, yo, check this out. You've never seen this before, like, and fire it off. Because it's one of those things that you watch a video of this, and they understand actually describing this material, and you're like, whoa. I mean, if I can show this to a guy in Tokyo, and through some sign language and some like bumbling of words, and like, no, oh, this isn't a ski. He's like, oh, and his eyes light up. Like that's when we're like, okay, this stuff is awesome. So we're we're, we're uh, marking the tech absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but how did that carry over from the one that you had, the machine that you had made yourself? Yeah, so we just a bunch of tests. I mean, we built the first ski, right? And then we built the squaw skis, the six belly pairs. And then we started, like, you know, how do you get this stuff into a ski? We're like, oh, do you put it on a layer on? I don't know. We tried that. Do you put it in grooves? I don't know. We tried that. Do you put it in really fat grooves? Do you put, like, a whole, like, sheet of this thing in? So we were trying different methods to figure out the, what's the most effective for one. In fact, like the graph I showed you, there's a few other lines that I blotted out that showed different lines of different layups we had done. So we basically just tested. That's all we did. We, just, we were in the shop, like, you know, hand planning away, like trying, shaving things down. We were taking like sandpaper and like literally like, hand shaving each little piece of, of this HGT inside of our ski. And uh, ultimately we found that the, most, the easiest way to manufacture, like basically the only way you can manufacture was doing these channels. And so 
after two years of that, when I was like, okay, I have to get a manufacturer, I basically just took a ski, cut it in half, and showed him what I had done, and just gave the manufacturer guy along with my CAD files, and he was like, okay, and just made it work. So we figured it out at that point. Yeah. Uh, two questions. What one non-Newtonian material is sort of like body armor, like like a motorcycle body armor, so it's soft like yep. this when it's just sitting there, but when there's an impact, it gets hard. Exactly. Is that, is that, and so that's the quality that you're talking mm -hmm. about when it's sort of soft stone. It's yep. not soft, but when when it hits a bump, right, it, 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 it will get hard. Exactly. Now my, my question is, could you speak a little more about the the uh, distribution? Yeah. model in the industry and what you're doing there because I think that's very interesting. I know we have some marketing students here to tell, you know, what's the industry, how does the industry work now if you're mm -hmm. trying to sell skis to yep. retail channels and what are you doing that's different? Yeah, yeah so the question was uh, about distribution. Uh, we got this cool technology, but how, um, beyond that, how are we getting our skis out there? So distribution model, this is how it works in the ski industry right now, right? I've got a ski, boom. We go to SIA, Yo, you should buy my ski, and people are like, oh, that's awesome, man, I wanna buy your ski. Psh, put an order for 50 orders in, right? And so I take their order, and I go back to my shop, and I have to go find money to build those 50 skis. So I find money, I build the 50 skis, and the shop, meanwhile, hasn't paid me a dime. And right before I deliver those skis, he can be like, oh, just kidding, man, I don't want those skis, like, um, but thanks anyhow. So I'm left with like all this inventory, that I, you know, that I was going to give to this guy and get paid for, um, it's sitting on my shelf. So that's one scenario. The other scenario is like he actually buys them, right? So he takes his keys in, I deliver them on time, he's psyched, he sells through them, I send him an invoice, and I might wait a year to be paid, right? So between the time you get the order in and you get paid, for a smaller companies, if you're lucky, about a year. Uh, if, you know, you're super lucky, maybe six months or something like that. So. I mean, for any of you that are doing business, like imagine having a cash flow where you don't see cash for a year and you've got one of the most capital intensive businesses out there. There's just no way to run a business, right? So rather than going through shops, you can do direct. I mean, that's the new hot thing right now, right? You just sell direct. I mean, that's every, every company, Casper is a mattress company in New York City. They're selling direct mattresses straight to cost people's doors. Like it works. The thing with direct is the ski industry is still super touchy-feely. People want to see the thing. It's not real unless they can see it. It's not real unless it's in the shop they can pick it up. It's not real unless it's there. So we have one side, bad payment structure and like just delays and really no control over what skis are selling when. The other way is like no exposure in the physical realm. Uh, people don't really know if you're actually legit because you're, you know, it's not physically there. And so in fact, like, you know, one way we knew it wasn't going to work, Jay was hammering direct, and that's what he does, and he's done a really good job with it. But I thought there was a different way, some way we could kind of cheat. You know, when I say get creative, yeah, we just made this thing up, right? We call it drop shipping. So all we do is we go to the shop and say, all right, you want some skis? Here's a phenomenal deal. If you want to buy these skis, you get, you get a huge margin. But you have to pay me right now. And they're always like, whoa. But you're gonna, they're like, oh, but I'm making a lot of money. So they can either opt in to get this huge margin up front if they pay me, or if they don't want to take the risk, if they don't want to do that, which is totally fine, then when the ski season comes around in the, in the fall, we do this thing called drop shipment, where they have one unit on the wall, and when someone buys a pair, they just go online, throw their code in when they check out, and bing, when that order goes through, I overnight a pair to that shop, they mount it up like normal, and the customer gets their ski mounted ready to go in a few days anyhow, like normal, right? So it was a way that we could basically give the control to the shop. If they want to dial up their risk, and, but make a lot of reward, they can do the pre-order system. They can buy up front. If they want to just you know, be cautious and see what happens and see if the skis actually sell, they can do the drop shipping method. And they can combine the two and shift that dial depending on how ballsy they feel, how much money is in the bank account, what they want to do. And it's because of that, we get to get into shops. We, don't, we get to get into shops very early on. If someone then on Stratton wants to be like, hey man, I want to sell your skis this year. I'm like, okay, great. Your code is XYZPQ2. And I'll send you a pair of demo skis and a display stand and you'll be rolling. Super, super easy. There's no like, crazy you know, ordering process and whatnot. And this way, not only do we know when they pre-order ski, not only do we know what, what we're typically dealing with in the spring when the people are putting these big orders in, so we know what to prepare for, but also 
when the drop shipment comes in, we know exactly to the ski what skis are selling, what skis are not selling, and exactly where they're selling. So we're the first company in the world that can actually do lean manufacturing. Big companies in the world, they check on the inventory once a year. Oh yeah, the Soul 7 sold really well. One of the best selling skis of all time, right? And they, they knew it was like, selling well, but they didn't, had no idea, and they still don't know exactly how many pairs they sold. Through drop shipment and pre-ordering, pre we know exactly when skis are going where. So we can set off a chunk of manufacturing time and dial in, dial up or dial down different SKUs and different models, different top sheets, different lengths, depending on what's selling real time. So a typical ski company might be left with 25% is, a typical, is the average um, of their skis left over. Imagine if 25% of your time, you had to sit in your hands and not do anything. Like that would just be horrible, right? So we, because of this me method, we get to know exactly where our skis are around the world at any given time right away. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, well, I'd say, well, to say the least, I mean, to win, like, the, um, the ISPO award we won, there was a huge argument in the, in the committee room, because um, no small company from America has ever won. Um, so for us to win, that was, like, this huge hurdle. And then after that, I went to Zurich, and I remember walking in the shop, and I had a pair of a prototype carving skis, and I was trying the shop kid, and he was like, oh, those are pretty cool, man. And I was like, yeah, we just won ISPO gold. And he was like, what? So... And he was literally going to buy that pair of prototypes off me right then and there. So people respect, uh, Wispo Award is, is <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, I see. It's thrown out just fine. Um, so, well, they reset very well. In Tokyo, is, people in Tokyo are going to go bonkers over it. <laughs> No, not yet. But I learned, a, I didn't, now I know much better how to do it. We had a, we had a, I had a contact out there that was going to introduce me about 15 shops, and that fell through like the day before I left. I almost didn't even go, but I'm really glad I did. So. Have you looked into like a display that can better show exactly how this material is mm -hmm. Yep. Like, like right in front of a person, not like yeah. ski or look into this little like. Yeah, window, totally. Field, like, right yeah. Yeah, so there's two different ways we can do that. One is the shop guy. We're like, we're, we're toying some ideas of like glass bottle and like wrapping this stuff in it and just smashing it because it's one of those things you like glass bottle, man. Like you smash, you expect it to break, and when it's like some like you just wrap it in this, and you're like, whoa, how the heck did that not like negate it? Um, so that's one way. We're also thinking about like, doing a displacing. Like one of, the, one of the displacings we cooked up was, you know, a concrete base with a with a glass pillar basically coming out of it, and we lean the ski against that. So just a beautiful display. We're just insetting it on an iPad or some kind of yeah. you know, film on repeat yeah. so that people can, when they're you know, too scared or when the guy's busy, can watch the video and just be like, whoa. Because that's like one of those things. It's, it's like yeah. the average person walks in and they don't know the yep. ski. They don't know the technology. Mm -hmm. there, yep, know. exactly. Yeah, they don't know to be looking into that window. Right, so that's one thing that we're, we're doing, so. Um, the people that have their hands on this thing, I probably have lost count, but I draw upon probably 10 or 15 different individuals and everything, you know, some people are like, hey man, I need some help with like AdWords. Like, I don't like, can I just give you a pair of skis? Like, for sure, dude. But as far as the company goes, it's just me. Um, yeah, I, mean, we're, I, I think we're gonna have quite a few more people. Yeah, <laughs> we, uh, the, the growth that we're projecting, um, we'll just say it's gonna be a wild ride, <laughs> that alone, so. Any question? Um, so you were saying you know, you're a very small American company and these big name brands. Yep. What are they doing about you coming in with this competitive advantage and you know, with your product? It must be freaking them out. Have you been approached by these large companies? Yeah, this, I mean, the CEO of Fisher, um, when we were at SIA, he gave his personal business, his personal card to, to my rep, Roy. Uh, so yeah, they know we're there. I mean, when you went in ISPO, um, like their ski was also in the room being judged directly against yours, so they know like, well, why didn't we win? Like who won kind of thing? So they definitely know we exist. Um, fortunately for us, they're behemoths. Like they're, they already did build, they started building skis for this year, like a year and a half ago. So they can't flip a, they can't flip a switch to make this stuff happen. It's also, well, not only you know, patented, so patent pending, so that's kind of a big, huge crux, but it's also super expensive. 
And because of our, distrib like our distribution model is the only way we can make this thing work because our, our COGS are just, I've never seen someone's costs of their raw materials so high because of this stuff. So that's kind of the reason why we had to cook, like, cook up the strap shipment thing was like, if we went through shops, we were never gonna make a dime. So we had to cook up this new way to do it. So that's another barrier to entry is like, you know, we have a, a patent coming through the pipes and we also have this huge barrier to entry just for cost. Like, if, this, if the price of a ski goes up by a buck, you know, two dollars for like a big company, that's a huge deal. They can't do that. You know, when he's talking about twenty dollars, they're just like, yeah, right, huh, that's funny. So it's a pretty cool thing to, uh, to have. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of problems with wear and tear with yep. um, ski every day for five, six, seven hours a day. Mm -hmm. And after a year, lots of times, the ski is just done. Mm -hmm. the, the bend in the ski is gone. Yeah, yeah the flex, uh, the pop. Kind of like delaminating, so yep. on and so forth. How yeah. is it with your ski? Because it sounds like mm -hmm. this material would actually work better against the uh, yeah. yeah, the construction of the ski is, I mean, everything other than the polymer is going to be, I guess, the same. But I will say this is the polymer, it breaks down at one third the rate of wood. So if something's gonna break down, it's not gonna be the HDT. It's gonna be something else. So, yeah. I think you had a few questions earlier. Um, yeah, but um, Sure. Uh, totally. Okay. We're out of questions. Oh. Well, oh. go ahead. Yeah. Have you ever thought of licensing, like licensing it? Like yeah, this is. Uh, I think this is the coolest thing in the world, and I think way more people than just us should have it. So we're working on, you know, figuring out basically what's our trajectory as our company, how do we get our name out there, and in the meantime, how do we also make sure that everybody else gets on board with something like this? So absolutely, licensing is a potential huge revenue source that's not typical of a ski company at all. So, yeah, we're looking to it. Cool. And uh, Cyrus? Thanks, guys. Thank you very yeah. much. Appreciate it.